Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen here in a minute, but my name is David York, and um, I'm founder and, and one of the managing partners of Top Tier Capital Partners. Um, and we're a, an investment firm in San Francisco um, that focuses exclusively investing in venture capital. And we're going to take you through a presentation here today, it's just a little bit of history about venture capital and some of the questions that Ben and Raul and others came up with in the group um, and try and give you some understanding of both the markets, uh, how they work a little bit, um, what, uh, what opportunities might be available for you, as well as uh, some of the successes that we've had in venture capital. And, you know, uh, because all of you are here in Silicon Valley, um, you know, most of the ecosystem that um, you find uh, around us in Silicon Valley has really been generated because of the success of startups, which are funded by venture capitalists. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll get going um, on the presentation. So bear with me for 30 seconds. Um, yada, yada. <clears throat> so this should take 30, 40 minutes. It could take a little longer, just depends how how much um, you guys want to hear about each of the pages, uh, please, you know, uh, either you through the chat room or, um, or, you know, speak, raise your hand and we'll be delighted to take questions. Um, but um, hope, hopefully you'll enjoy the conversation. Thanks. Um, so just, I thought I'd start with a little bit of background about, um, about us and about me. Um, so, you know, uh, just for, for your edification, we, uh, we graduated from college in 1984. So I'm older than probably most of your parents, at least I know I'm older than Ben's parents. Um, and um, we started uh, originally on Wall Street and then ultimately joined an investment firm to start a business for them. And uh, that firm uh, became Top Tier Capital Partners. Today, um, and, and that all happened over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, we've now bought offices in Boston, San Francisco, and London. Um, and we manage on a regulatory basis about seven and a half billion of uh, investors' money. Uh, like I said earlier, focused exclusively on venture capital. This is an illustration, a little bit of our history. Um, I only show you this just to, so you have an understanding of the businesses we're in. So the the, uh, the initial business was a separately managed account uh, for a very large pension. Actually, it was the government of Singapore is how we got into business. Um, and then um, these funds across the top here are funds that focus exclusively on investing in other venture capital funds. The concept of that is a fund of funds. So think of like a mutual fund that invests in venture capital funds. Um, these funds are typically very diversified um, and make for an attractive, conservative way to play the venture space. Um, and then in the 2010, 2011 timeframe, we started doing more secondaries and co-investments and ultimately lost, launched our own uh, secondary co-investment fund, which I'll talk to you about what that is in a, in a little while. But uh, this is a, an area where we can invest more closely into companies. So think of investing in companies that are typically have 10 million or more of revenue or are growing uh, at more than 50% a year. And then just recently, uh, oh, I've launched a program uh, focused on Europe. Um, Europe today is um, an attractive technology market. Uh, it's growing, it's not growing quite as quickly as the US, but the valuations are quite a bit cheaper. So we find it's a nice investment arbitrage. And if you follow the press or quite a few uh, European venture capital firms, or excuse me, U.S. venture capital firms have been moving to Europe as well. So we're, we're excited about this program along with the other programs we run today. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk uh, a little bit about venture and uh, the history of the industry. Um, and I, we wanted to pull these slides, these pictures together, kind of to give you some faces and some names of some of the people um, that were responsible for some of the companies you see on the right-hand side of the screen. But you know, venture is, it was one of the original investment activities, even going back as far as, you know, if you think about Christopher Columbus, you know, he went and raised money from uh, Queen uh, Isabella from Portugal, 
to um, uh, sail to, you know, essentially around the world and conquer new lands. And that, that was a venture capital investment, if you think about what he went there to do and what he came back with. Uh, here in Silicon Valley, one of the original uh, early venture capital folks is a fellow by the name of Arthur Rock. And Arthur is still alive today. Um, he offices a short distance from where I'm sitting here in San Francisco. And he was originally an investment banker. Mr. Rock is down here uh, in the corner on the, uh, on the left-hand side of, of the pictures. And um, uh, he was responsible as an investment banker for raising money for something called Fairchild Semiconductor which um, ultimately became uh, the predecessor to Intel. Uh, and Arthur um, went and started his own venture firm uh, off of that activity and um, invested in companies like Intel and Apple and many others. And so he's one of the original uh, venture capitalists and uh, that really started, helped start the technology industry in, in, semi, uh, in Silicon Valley today. Um, and, um, uh, you know, one of our sort of forefathers, if you will, around um, uh, investing here. Uh, some of the other people you see here on the screen, uh, there's an individual here in the middle. Um, his name is Dick Kramlick. Uh, Dick started, a, actually went to work for Mr. Rock as an associate, uh, and then ultimately started his own firm called New Enterprise Associates or NEA. Uh, but one of the things that Dick is famous for is uh, his, his uh, investment in PowerPoint, um, this uh, slide presentation and a lot of the ways we communicate are, would, wouldn't be even available if Dick hadn't decided to put up some of his own personal capital uh, and keep PowerPoint going. He ultimately sold it for about $38 million to Microsoft uh, in the 1980s. But uh, that's, uh, that's how it became part of Microsoft's suite of office um, things. Another very successful venture capital is a fellow by the name of Tom Perkins and Eugene Kleiner. These two down here formed a firm called Kleiner Perkins. Uh, Kleiner Perkins is famous for uh, lots of things, including Genentech. Uh, one of their uh, partners uh, decided to help launch a firm called Genentech. And so uh, Herb Boyer was the, was the science behind that. and, and um, one of Tom's partners helped him get that off the ground. Another famous venture capitalist here in Silicon Valley is a fellow by the name of Don Valentine. And Don is um, uh, the individual here um, that's left capital research to start a venture capital firm called Sequoia back in the 1960s and um, late 60s, early 70s. And that became, uh, and it is today, one of is the most successful venture firm in the world. Sokoya Capital. And as you can see, they've invested in some very interesting companies from Atari to Apple to Cisco, uh, Google, um, et cetera. So a very successful company. I think the most recent success they've had has been the largest investor in a company called Snowflake that went public here this last fall and was a very successful public offering. Um, if you step back and look at uh, how the industry has evolved, um, typically the industry is sort of uh, uh, here in Silicon Valley has gone through waves. And what we mean by that is that there's been a, a technology that or a, an activity that has created a lot of hype. And then ultimately that hype um, creates a bubble and the bubble kind of collapses. Uh, and then from that um, wreckage starts a new wave. Um, and so if you follow time going back to really after the Second World War, um, that is really when things started to get going in, in the technology front. And the early investors in the first wave were corporate corporations. Um, and then there was the evolution of Silicon Valley. Uh, and then the third wave, which we might call the internet era. And then today we sort of sit in an era of um, you know, combination of all those things. We, we coined it here, the, the unicorn era, but if anything, it was really um, expressed through the success of social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. And then finally, uh, the post COVID era, which is gonna be full of a lot of interesting things. And we're, as an investor, I, I'm probably as bullish as I've ever been on the space because of what's gone on through COVID. But We'll go through each of these different cycles and um, 
give you some more background on, on each of them uh, and who were the players in that. Excuse me. Um, so the very beginning, like I said, after the Second World War and, and uh, as things progressed in the 70s, um, corporations started to invest aggressively in um, for innovation, really trying to develop new products and new things to expand upon uh, their success uh, after the um, uh, after the Second World War uh, business success. And so um, Exxon and DuPont and Boeing were all active corporate investors. Um, we, we're missing one here that I thought of as, a, as we were looking at these slides the other day is AT&T. That was when Bell Labs really was becoming very prevalent. And um, most of the innovation was done inside the workshops of these big companies. Um, we don't, it, it, the, the venture industry kind of grew out of this as people started to do this on their own. And that was really the start of Silicon Valley. Uh, like I mentioned, Arthur Rock and, and Don Valentine and Tom Perkins, they were the real early uh, lead investors in Silicon Valley, but they've cr they created an enormous amount of wealth and also um, economy, if you will, out of the investments they made in the various different technologies that were growing uh, during the, the 80s and the 70s. And if you step back and think about what happened here, it was really during this period of time that we built uh, the technologies that really made the infrastructure for the internet as we know it today. So if you think about the chip industry or the personal computer industry or the telecommunications industry, um, they all, all of the infrastructure and, and uh, frankly activity that went on there really came out of this period. And it set a foundation uh, for us to actually set up for the next cycle, which uh, happened uh, really around the internet. And um, I don't know if you all know who this is, but the fellow here on the screen is uh, Mark Andreessen. Um, he was um, uh, an undergrad at uh, Illinois State University in, in uh, Urbana-Champaign. Or Champaign, uh, and that was there that they developed something called Mosaic. Uh, it was a, sophomore, a software code uh, that allowed you to browse the internet. If you go back in time, the internet was actually started along uh, as, a, as a, a way to connect the universities together way before we started to use it publicly. Um, and so Mark invented the software for that and that proved something was called Netscape. Um, and Netscape was a public offering in 1995. And that was one of the seminal moments at the beginning of the internet era. Um, Amazon went public a year later uh, Netscape ultimately was acquired, um, and it was acquired by American Online, uh, and then ultimately American Online uh, was trade was acquired by Time Warner. But um, Netscape is essentially is a browser, very similar to what you use at home. If you guys use Chrome or or Explorer or uh, any of the other uh, open source browsers out there. Um, this is, it all started originally with, with what Mark was doing with Mosaic. Um, there was also a time for continued growth on the corporate venture capital side. So people like Intel launched their venture capital activity. And there was a period of time by the late nineties where Intel was the largest venture capital investor in the world. Um, but this is, uh, this is the internet era. So if you remember the internet bubble, this was created during this period of time. Um, in the late 90s and through the late 90s and into early 2000. Um, you know, off of that internet infrastructure build and then the, the software, um, ultimately we started to build um, large uh, companies. Um, you know, we're calling it the unicorn era here. Um, you, you could call it the social media era as well, uh, where, um, individuals like Mark Zuckerberg or, or um, the folks that started Twitter uh, or other, you know, Groupon or other services like that, figured out how to aggregate and use the internet to build businesses that ultimately became uh, large platforms. And, um, uh, and, and from that created lots of revenue and therefore big companies, but it was during this period of time that that happened. Um, 
the uh, this this chart only goes through 2017. We've actually had more money invested in 2019 uh, and or 2017, 2018, 2019 than we had in the prior year. So trends continued and um, investment activity really took off after the uh, global financial crisis in 2007. Um, I'm going to stop there um, and just make sure there aren't any questions, Ben, um, from anybody in the audience. Uh, no, I think we're all good right now. Uh, okay. One question we got was, why was there such a big, um, you know, fall in the investment activity? Um, I don't have, I, it's actually, I could click through and do a better graphic on it on the NASDAQ's chart, but We've had um, we've had three major market declines in venture capital in the last since the early '90s. Really, if you go back to the early '90s through '99, that there were you know typical market trends, but there wasn't really a tail off until 2000 when we peaked uh, what they say the top of the internet bubble. Um, that bubble burst for various reasons. One was um, uh, there were a couple things going on within the economy as related to the Gulf Wars. And the other was um, that as the, the valuations got way inflated and then people started to realize that um, the revenue projections were really reliant on more startups. And so the startups themselves uh, didn't have any revenue. So it was sort of this fake or ballooned fictitious revenue expectation and so all of that ultimately collapsed on itself and then at the same time that revenue was also driving a massive build in telecommunications assets so think bandwidth um, and things of that nature and those um, telecommunication infrastructure assets also collapsed because the users and the people that were going to essentially support them uh, went away as well and so there was a sort of a double whammy, if you will, uh, and during the internet bubble bursting that created a massive decline in, in investing uh, from 1999 to 2003, the industry shrunk by almost 60%, 70% in some cases. And so, um, and it wasn't really till the start of 2005, 2006, that it started to pick up again. And then by 2008, it felt like things were starting to get back to normal. And then we had the bankruptcies around uh, the mortgage crisis, which turned into the global financial crisis and to, with Lehman Brothers and others going out of business in the late 2008 timeframe uh, and then continued into 2009 and 2010. Now, the, the benefits of both those declines is there was an opportunity to sort of reset the expectations in the industry. And we'll talk about the new models and things here in a minute. But um, those resets typically allow for more innovation than in periods of excess. When things are going really well, nobody quits their jobs to start a new company. When things are going poorly, a lot of times they're laid off. And so they decide, you know what, I'm gonna start a new company. And that, that creates you know, a lot more options on innovation. And then it actually regenerates um, a lot of excitement around um, investing. If, you, if you're thinking about where the future is going as opposed to worrying about the losses you might take. So um, those are the two major market declines. And then what's happened since the global financial crisis, frankly, is that people have gotten more and more comfortable with technology and technology has driven the economies around the world um, as people, if you look at the success in China with companies like Tencent or Alibaba or here in the US, uh, with you know, with uh, the, the you know, frankly, the five largest companies in the world are are, are startups at one point: Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, uh, Google, and Facebook. So, um, all of that has made this industry much more visible um, than it typically is. It's usually, on average, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to ten percent of a typical uh, portfolio uh, of what I'd call a consider, you know, a professionally managed portfolio. And, um, it, you know, today it's, it's closer to 15% of what people are doing. And so, um, that's just, it's changed over that period of time. And I would, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit as we go through the rest of these slides, but we really, um, 
we think COVID is a period of reset as well. It just it reset to technology as opposed to nothing. And so, uh, if anything, t today technology is, and what I call it, the innovation economy, uh, is more sought after uh, than ever because it's very clear if you're not going there, you're going to get eaten by somebody who has. And so, um, venture capital and venture investing is as is as good a time to be putting money to work as ever. So. Um, let me talk a little bit about how that works. Um, you know, the, the next section is going to be um, uh, covering mechanics. And so as an individual, um, you kind of have three choices um, to invest in venture capital. You can invest uh, on your own. Um, if you are not, if you are an accredited investor, you can write uh, you can invest as much money as you want. Um, an accredited investor is the private placement rule. Most of these companies are started are private and therefore they, they are uh, governed by private placement rules. Uh, and that typically means that you have to be earning more than $200,000 a year or jointly with your spouse over $250,000 a year and have a net worth uh, either with your spouse or without that's at least a million dollars. And that's an accredited investor. The other way you can do it is under the non-accredited investor rules, which is uh, a lot of the places this happens around crowdfunding, where you can invest less than $25,000 without any restriction in as many companies as you want. Um, that's one way to do it, investing into companies directly. The other way to invest in venture capital um, is to put money with a firm uh, that's an expert um, at investing in venture capital. Um, and that means you have to make a decision on which firm you want to invest with. Today, there are about 2,000 seed managers in the United States and about 1,000 or traditional venture capitalists. So those are people that do Series A all the way up through Series D. The seed managers typically stop investing after Series A. And so that's the very front end of the market. There's the traditional middle part of the market, which I call is early stage. And then the late stage part of the market um, is something we call growth. Um, and there are firms that specialize in growth. There's firms, uh, most of them are household names that you guys have heard of like Sequoia or Kleiner. Um, and they do early stage in that area between seed and, and the kind of the D rounds, which is the growth rounds. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is invest in um, firms that specialize in investing in venture capital like top tier. Uh, we are you know, one of the world's leading providers of venture capital investment for, for institutions around the world. There are about a half a dozen of us that really kind of all compete in this space. There's probably a total of about 30 in general uh, globally, but uh, two or three of us are kind of in the top two or three and we'd be one of those. It just depends on your flavor. But if you look at it at assets under management, we're currently ranked third. If you look at it as far as the people we compete with on a daily basis, it's in the first or second, but it just depends on who you are. But what we do is provide um, a fund of funds product, uh, which is a global portfolio of sort of the best managers uh, we can access. Um, and these are managers that typically would be hard for individuals to access. Um, and that's, think of it as a portfolio of 20 to 25 funds. Um, our portfolios on average are roughly 500 million in size at a pop, you know, and so we just recently raised our ninth fund uh, to, in, to focus on this space. Um, and then we also invest in venture capital through secondaries, which is another way to participate Secondaries are the reselling of interests in venture capital funds or the reselling of interests in private start companies that are typically started by, by venture capitalists. So think of startups where the founder, you know, um, he decides he needs to sell a little bit of his ownership to, to buy a house or put his kids through school or something like that. That's a secondary transaction. We will we'll sometimes help that founder with uh, acquiring those stock, those in those units, if you will, in the company, they're typically in the form of common or preferred shares. Um, we'll also invest in companies directly as a co-investor. And we've done that through our, what we call our velocity funds. Uh, these funds typically have 
uh, early liquidity vis-a-vis uh, -vis owning a fund for its whole life. Um, and so uh, we focus on high cash flows from these funds and typically are generating um, really, really strong returns uh, with, with that approach. Uh, and then recently we've built a program uh, focused on Europe and Israel, like I mentioned earlier, and that includes both fund of funds and, and secondaries and co-investments in those funds that we sponsor in that portfolio. But uh, like I said earlier, there's three ways to invest. You can invest in a company directly. Uh, so you have to pick the right one, which is super hard. Uh, you can invest in a manager that invests in companies, uh, which can be hard because there's so many choices. Um, or you can invest in a manager that is essentially a manager of managers, which is a fund of funds, like which is what we do. Um, our investors are usually large pensions. Our largest investor, we have two um, that are with, ones with the state as the state of Ohio's employee public retirement system, and the other is the largest pension system in the state of, in the country of Germany. Um, and so they're um, and they view it to us because they figure you know we're not experts, you guys are, and um, uh, we're going to let you worry about that problem for us in our portfolio. Uh, so let's go further into the mechanics. So um, this is talking about kind of how companies are are started and kind of where the money comes from. So if you wanted to do a startup, this uh, graphic here is a nice illustration about how that all works. Um, I will just tell you at a high level, most startups are funded by the entrepreneur uh, or his parents, his or her parents. I know there are a couple of women on the phone today. So, um, and that helps you get a business kind of sorted out. I mean, it, because of the way technology works today, um, most startups usually have some vision of, uh, of their product and what they're trying to create before they start to raise money. Um, the, the days of an idea on a napkin um, turning into a, into a successful outcome are kind of gone uh, because the co competitive nature of raising money is such that you usually have to be a little bit further along than just an idea on a napkin to have people give you cash. Um, you know, the, there's a suggestion here on this graphic that you find a co-founder. That's not always the case. But I can tell you most startups have two or three people around the table usually uh, because one's good at, say, coding, one's good at sales, one's good at finance or something like that. And, and three of you kind of come together and move the ball down the field as you worry about different, different things as you get the company off the ground. Uh, seed market then is where you raise money the first time. And usually the, that's um, a, a financing round that's anywhere from uh, 250,000 to half a million dollars at the low end to kind of two or $3 million at the high end. It just depends on what type of business you're trying to build and, and frankly, how much money you wanna to raise to get it off the ground. One of the things that happens when you raise money in the venture capital market is you um, actually sell part of your company. And so you start to give up ownership. And um, most of your parents can explain that to you, but ownership's important uh, if you're trying to become wealthy. <laughs> the more you own of your company and the more it succeeds, the more, it, the more wealth it creates for you. And so there's this tug of war about how much ownership do I give up before I lose control and therefore lose the opportunity to be as wealthy as I wanna be. Um, if you go speak to very successful entrepreneurs, they have an enormous confidence in their ability to create value. And so they don't really care about ownership because it, their attitude is whatever I do, it's gonna be big enough that I'll have plenty. Um, and that's you know um, Charles Schultz who started something called um, uh, Starbucks said he never raised enough money. It, if he'd raised more money faster, he would have made a big, much bigger company faster. And so it's the, it's the one of the tricky things that you forget um, as you're starting off is that notion of what you're trying to build versus the cost of doing it. And so that's why as you, as you grow a business uh, as an entrepreneur, it can uh, be very complicated 
uh, because the people piece and the emotion and, and all that stuff gets involved as the company starts to become more successful. But these, these rounds are typically done during the VC funding period, which is described here. Um, and then at some point, um, if the business is successful enough, either someone is interested in it uh, as an acquisition or someone, uh, or you think you might be able to actually take it public. And public offerings are kind of the holy grail for venture investments. Uh, the reason for that is that they give you the most valuation for what you've done. Um, public markets typically um, and give you uh, higher valuations than private marketplaces. And so therefore most entrepreneurs as they build businesses, try to think about what they can build that'll ultimately become a successful public company. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, this next thing is about, this, this whole section is about mechanics. So I just wanted to, that was the entrepreneur's framework. This is if you're raising money. Um, and, and you're investing. So if you're a venture capitalist or an investor like myself, um, one of the things you try and understand is how the money's working inside the investments that are being made. And during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, what we call the old VC model, this was when it uh, was typically a company went out and raised two or $3 million, uh, got a, you know, essentially got themselves started then they raised another two or $3 million and got themselves some customers. And then they raised another two or $3 million and ultimately got a product into market. And the total there was almost $10 million. Um, there were lots of companies at the time that they were going to market, realized that nobody cared. This is whole notion of product market fit, but <clears throat> which is you have a great idea, you build a great product and then you take it to market and nobody shows up. And then you have to go raise more money to adjust your product, which they call pivoting, to get it to fix to to fit into the marketplace. Um, so there was there was the opportunity in the old model to lose a lot of money, because if you pivoted a couple of times and ultimately you figured out it just wasn't going to work, nobody cared. Uh, there was an old computer that uh, John Doerr sponsored at Kleiner Perkins called Go, it was the very first tablet computer. It was done before. Um, the iPod or um, Palm, and the, nobody just cared about it. It didn't matter how much money they threw at it, nobody cared. Um, there's something that came out recently uh, with uh, Jeffrey Kassenberg down in Los Angeles called QB uh, or Quibi. I can't remember exactly how she pronounces it. These were little short video snippets that they were going to, they raised a billion dollars to get this company off the ground. And within a year, they realized nobody cared. So um, that model has evolved into this, this model today, which is the seed model I was describing earlier, where a venture capitalist will invest 250 to a million dollars in a company. You will do all the stages you did here, but they'll only take at the end of the day about $5 million. So the risk is a lot less. Uh, and also the ca it's much more capital efficient, which is how we came up with this term, capital efficiency. So a venture firm, it ultimately makes roughly 50 to 60 bets per fund on startups. And then when the companies ultimately get their product market fit sorted out, they end up weeding that 50 or 60 names down to about 15. And those are the ones that turn into successful investments. But the, the actual out-of-pocket risk is about half to a third of what it was in the old traditional way. So today venture is an investment activity. We think, especially if you work with sophisticated managers, is actually a lot less risky than the market thinks it is. Um, what do I want? This is another illustration of mechanics. Um, I think I've covered it in detail, but uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna move to the next page. So there, there were some questions about how uh, venture capitalists as individuals work. So if you think we talked about how you would do it, how you'd raise money as an entrepreneur, talked about the investment model, and, and people have asked a little bit about their time. How do they spend their time? And most venture capitalists have, at some point have had some experience starting a business or working for startups and um, have some 
what we, we call a track record in, in, in an, as an entrepreneur. Uh, because at the end, a venture capitalist as an individual is essentially um, a coach. Um, they uh, spend a lot of time helping their entrepreneurs figure out how to succeed with the businesses they're building. And the, a lot of ways they do that is by uh, levering their networks um, and bringing entrepreneurs uh, employees that they want to hire or bringing them consultants or things of that nature. And so um, we, this, this chart breaks down their day-to-day, -day, sort of their daily work. But um, if you'll see here, um, a lot of this recruiting is very important uh, as it relates to startups, because you might be a great software engineer, but you don't know how to run a company or you need a sales and marketing person or you need an HR person or those sorts of things. And so venture capitalists spend a lot of time not only picking businesses like soliciting, but also um, uh, recruiting to help businesses. Once they build a portfolio, they spend an enormous amount of time in this coaching department, uh, which is being a director or a member of the investment group that's helping the venture firm get off the ground. And, and that coaching is the thing that they find most appealing. Uh, they spend a bunch of time raising money. So we got listed down here, you know, they raise money. So venture, venture capitalists um, don't put up out of their own personal uh, wallets, the money that they put into startups, they actually get that money from investors. They do put up some money, it's about 2% of a fund. Uh, but the rest of the money comes from other institutions. And uh, they usually endowments, uh, some individuals and family offices and pension funds are make up most of the uh, capital that goes into venture capital funds. And on a return basis, if venture capitalists do their job right, um, they'll return something in the neighborhood of two to three times the amount of money uh, that they raise. So if a venture capitalist raised $100 million, then over a period of 10 years, they would return somewhere between 200 and 300 million back. Some funds have done much better than that. Um, for instance, the uh, Axel Facebook fund returned 13 times because of its original investment in Facebook. It's, uh, it's the Axel, if you guys don't know, is the founding investor of Facebook and put up the seed cap, excuse me, the series A capital for, uh, the, for Facebook that turned into a very successful outcome. Um, if you do that right, and within a reasonable period of time, the compounder rates of return should be in the, the low to mid 20s. And if you have extreme success, it'll be much higher than that. Um, <clears throat> I thought this would be interesting as you think about where the money is for venture capital in the US. This was, an, uh, I thought, a very accurate illustration of how um, money is sprinkled around the country. The, the largest market by far is here in the Bay Area. Uh, and if you include all of California, it's, it's, it's you know, about 60% of the ecosystem. Um, there's quite a bit of capital in New England, primarily around Boston uh, and New York. Um, and, uh, and then there's what I would call some hubs, one in Atlanta, one in Austin, Texas, one in Seattle, a little bit in Denver, a little bit in Salt Lake City. You can see where these, these, these dots are landing, but um, a little bit around Washington, D.C. Um, there's an area in North Carolina called the Research Triangle. They have some venture capital there, uh, a little bit in Chicago and in Minneapolis. Um, you know, the rest are rel relatively small markets uh, because um, seed investing, this model of seed investing that I talked about earlier um, allows for such little amount of money to be put up to help companies get started. Uh, venture capitalists have become less con confined to Silicon Valley and, and New England and starting to spread around the country. So this is Des Moines, this little dot right here. Um, uh, this is Albuquerque. Um, and so uh, I don't know all these other things. This is uh, Savannah, Georgia, or no, it's Hilton Head, I guess, South Carolina, um, Miami, uh, Tampa, you know, New Orleans. And so we're, we're not surprised to see this happen, but uh, for better or for worse, you guys live 
in the backyard of what I call the Super Bowl of venture capital. Um, if you want to be successful in this activity or be successful in starting a technology business and want to be the best in the world, you come to Silicon Valley because it's the most competitive and has the most talent and um, frankly creates the best outcomes. And so um, that's part of the reason why most of the dollars are here. I thought this was a better um, example of how the money works and how the risk works and how the companies get, get grow. Um, and um, again, there's a lot to cover here, but in general, um, if you see down here, seed early stage, zero to 5 million of revenue. And that's really in this period of the company getting started. Uh, early to early stage is from five to 50 million in revenue. And so if you think about sales, that's kind of in here in this area, um, this is underneath venture capital, this area, and then growth, typically more than 50 million in revenue. And so that's when the business is up here. The risk in investing in the business comes down dramatically as more and more revenue comes into the company. Because then you have a lot better visibility on the products, the customers, uh, the management team, everything else as the company gets further along in its cycle. Um, and that's as you get to later and later in the company's life and the more successful it is, you can go public. Um, public companies today, typically uh, you have to have revenue somewhere between 100 and $300 million. Uh, back in the 90s, when the internet bubble was being created, you needed revenue between 15 and $30 million. So businesses are a lot more mature today when they go public than, than they were then. And a lot of that has to do with regulations and a lot of it has to do with the marketplace itself evolving. Uh, as I talked to you about that capital efficiency and some of those things, the companies are a lot more mature be today uh, before they go public because of it. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the market um, uh, today. And so this just shows you the activity um, uh, that happened last year. Um, and if you remember that earlier chart, we showed 2017 being a very successful year and then things dropped off. Well, they actually took off in 18 and 19 uh, with um, the extension of really the unicorn era and those companies ultimately going public uh, created a, a great deal of enthusiasm around investing in startups. Um, we thought the COVID market would decline a little bit like it did here in the global financial crisis. If you look from 2008 to 2009, 2010, we didn't get back to the 2008 period really until 2013. So there was about five years there of building back up. And so we kind of thought we would have a decline of 20 to 25%. We did have a decline of about um, about 15% in deals, but the dollars didn't decline that much. So these deals were much bigger uh, than they were last year. Uh, but in, and so in general, the money that flowed into space is uh, in the early stage level really hasn't slacked off much, uh, which um, is, is this notion of the tip over into the innovation economy I talked about earlier. So I, we think this will continue. Um, we don't see this trend slowing. Uh, we, we see a lot of exciting things. We'll talk about it at the end um, happening uh, in the innovation economy that are going to change your lives as much as they're going to change mine. And, and uh, um, this is what in, in excites us about venture firms and venture capital investing. Um, the late stage market was a place that attracted much more money uh, because of uh, the whole acceleration of the digital economy. Uh, and that was then reflected in the public markets as well. And we'll show you that sl those slides here in a second. But late stage, if you remember the definition, um, those were companies that were doing over 50 million in revenue. So these are big businesses that are growing very quickly. And what they've decided to do is take money from private investors as opposed to public investors. And so, um, and that market continues to expand. Um, and we, and we think that market will continue to thrive as sort of an active late stage market uh, in the US, which is a new phenomenon. Because you can see back here, if you go back to the page before, early stage was 12 billion in 2006 and late stage was about the same number. So not, not, not as much extension as you have here where you almost have more than double what we did in the early stage market in 2020. Um, 
so exits um one of the things that happens with venture investments is at some point the investors have to realize uh, the outcome of their investment. Um, it's just a natural phenomenon and it really has to do with um, the structure of the funds that help you start your company as well as your employees who at some point need to benefit from all the equity you've given them uh, instead of salary. One of the things that is um, really not talked about much in Silicon Valley, but uh, employees and startups typically get ownership versus um, take-home pay because it's easy to give ownership and hard to give take-home pay. Take-home pay consumes precious cash and the cash is used to grow the business. And so instead of using that cash to pay employees, you give them ownership. Now, if the ownership works and you ultimately get to the public marketplace, you can monetize that and that value could be much greater than anything you would have earned uh, in the form of cash. So it's it's one of those incentives that people use in our industry and it's very popular, but it's what creates this exit outcome here. Um, and it's usually in the form of, of what we call a, a trade sale where you sell your software business to another software business um, or an IPO. Those are the two places you can exit. Um, and um, it usually happens in the three to 12 year time frame. It's usually later, but sometimes you'll have early exits because the company's getting to a place where you kind of realize it's not going to be a big firm. It's just going to be a product. And so typically that's when trade sales happen. And then later exits happen because the company's succeeding and continues to raise that, that private round money, like I talked about. Uh, that ultimately turns into a public company um, later in life. Here's some, we're going to go through some examples of some of the more successful exits over time. And this is a scatter plot of um, valuation and size of exit. And the, the dots represent the actual outcome uh, at the IPO and when where they were valued. Um, Alibaba was by far and away the most valuable company at Exit. Um, you know, so you can see Twitter here uh, and Facebook. Um, Facebook was valued at 100 billion. If you were part of that IPO like we were, the company went down in value, uh, went to about 60 billion before it turned around. And today Facebook's worth almost, I think, north of 500 billion. Twitter, same thing, it went up and then it went down. Um, ultimately, I think today the company's valued at around 50 billion. Um, the orange dots show you where things were sold. So, um, you know, Flipkart was sold to Walmart at about 20 billion in India. Um, these, anyway, these are some of the exits that out there in the world. Um, and this is the top 25. And I think this is as of 2018. Um, so there have been others since then. Um, this graphic here on the left, I think, is really one of the most important things to say about the venture capital industry um, as it relates to the U.S. economy. So venture-backed companies as a percentage of public U.S. companies founded since 1979 represent 43% of the U.S. public companies and 57% of the market cap um, and represent 38% of the employees and 82% of the research dollars in the US today or at that time. And I, I think this was done a while back. So it's it's actually grown since then, yeah, 2014. Um, but what, what I think at the end, what I want you to take away is that venture capitalists create, they create valuable companies and they create jobs. And um, the little bit of money that goes into starting a business can ultimately turn into a very productive public uh, contribution in a way that um, it's one of the few places in investing where you can actually see this outcome where a little bit of dollars go in and creates this much value. Um, this is an illustration of um, the market capitalization, the number of companies in the US, the total numbers. Um, this is an illustration of uh, number of employees working at VC backed companies. Um, so you can see it's a bigger and bigger percentage of the employee base. These are venture startups 
uh, that have happened over a period of time. Uh, and then these are industries that have grown um, and are sponsored by venture back firms. Um, and you can see software and electronics and healthcare are by far the way the largest. Um, technology is working its way into transportation and real estate and things of that nature. And so that's growing today. But um, most of what we invest in are uh, in the technology areas of healthcare and software. Um, and really the reason for doing that is it's a very efficient place to invest. Um, you can put a little bit of money together and a couple of guys that are really smart at programming and build a really successful software business. Uh, and so the efficiency of capital there is huge and that's why people uh, in the venture space like software so much. This is an example of venture firms that have succeeded over time. Some of these I suspect you've heard of like Amazon or Apple. Um, some you might not, Epic Games, I think you guys all know because you play Fortnite, but uh, um, Lotus Software, I don't know if you remember Lotus. Lotus was the very first spreadsheet. <laughs> um, and uh, ultimately Microsoft came along and created Excel to, to not and compete with it. it ult Lotus got acquired uh, by Compact, or excuse me, not Compact, IBM. Um, Compact got acquired by Hewlett Packard. Electronic Arts is still around. LSI Logic is still around. Netscape got acquired by American Online. Uh, Yahoo um, is no longer, uh, Yahoo is a part now of AOL, which is spun out of Time Warner, uh, is owned by uh, Verizon. So um, this stuff all kind of moves around, but you can see when the companies were started and, and uh, some of the success that the venture industries created. Uh, these are the uh, biggest, most successful bets of all time um, at the time of liquidity. Uh, SMIC is a, a semiconductor company in China um, and uh, literally just went public last year. Uh, uh, Maituan and um, what else is on here? Alibaba, um, JD.com are all uh, Chinese businesses. Um, WhatsApp was acquired uh, by Facebook. Groupon is uh, still public. Um, Sarant and Mobileye are not household names like you would expect, um, but you can see when they went public or when they were formed and, and when the liquidity came. Or actually when the actually this, this is the time that they got public, so, um, or, yeah, the dates don't make sense on some of these. Oh, well, anyway, some of the bigger bets. Have you guys played Candy Crush? Um, King here is was the Candy Crush company. Um, and I just get back to your earlier comment about the decline. So this is uh, how technologies performed over the last, oh, uh, 30 years almost. Uh, 26, I think. Um, so this is the internet bubble here. Um, and you can see it's had a slow, steady decline. It took us three years to reach a bottom. And then we started to climb out of it. And we had the global financial crisis. And one of the benefits that we all got as investors during the global, global financial crisis is it reset everything, real estate, fixed income, uh, buyouts. You pick an industry, it all got set to zero. And so for venture, it actually allowed for a lot of people that got laid off to start new jobs and recreate something. And as people came out of that, they started to invest in technology in their companies to make them more successful. And that's really what's created this growth of, of NASDAQ is the, is the growth of technology consumption. And last year, frankly, it had a fantastic year. It was up 43%. So uh, this little blip right here is COVID. Um, this was... Uh, March and this was April and then it, it, it went on from there. So um, we're very excited about where venture capital is. We are worried about valuations as it relates to technology, but we think technology trends in general are gonna continue to be very, very strong. This is another illustration of how important technology is to the S&P 500. Uh, and so you can see today technology values represent um, roughly 38% of all of the market cap in the S&P 500. Um, 
you know, historically it's represented in the 15. So it's been quite a bit of growth in technology and uh, companies uh, over the last over the last year. This is last year's numbers, but um, in general, uh, so. And then I think this is the second to last slide. Um, this is showing you kind of how technology has grown uh, in market cap as well as relevance as it relates to the US economy. So we're going back over, these are 10 year periods, but the, in 1980, the five largest companies in the US uh, had one technology company, if you, AT&T at the time was uh, uh, still not split up. Um, so it was kind of a phone, it was the phone business and a monopoly, but um, you know, Standard Oil is now Chevron. Um, Schlumber J is in the oil services industry, has a great deal of technology, but it's really an oil, it's an oil driller. Um, and then 10 years later, we have IBM still is the largest company in the US and Exxon, General Electric, uh, Philip Morris, the, the cigarette company, Royal Dutch Shell, um, which is, um, um, she's got the wrong, <laughs> oh, well, I missed that. Sorry, this is supposed to be uh, uh, Shell Oil, um, which is another oil company. So if you go back into the 90s, coming out of the 80s, we have quite, quite a few industrial companies. Um, in 2000, General Electric was the most valuable company. Exxon was second. Pfizer um, was third. So drugs started to become and, and drug manufacturers became very valuable. Citigroup was very valuable and Cisco for routers. So if you remember when we were talking about the internet and the infrastructure being built in the seventies and eighties routers. Um, so think about the backbone of the internet. So that's what gave this a lot of value. Um, GE has fallen dramatically off the wagon. It's now it's fourth year. And then by 2020, it's no longer it's actually no longer in the top 100 um, as their business have changed radically and they did not keep up with technology. Um, but you'll notice um, we've got one real venture capital startup here at Cisco and then Microsoft and Apple make it in 2010. Uh, Cisco falls away. Uh, Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, and then 2020, now all five of these businesses are venture startups. Um, and you wish you'd have bought Amazon at the global financial crisis low, which was about $6 or something like that. That's been an incredible growth story. Um, so some of the other questions that you guys asked us that we thought we'd try and talk about um, as this is sort of wraps up the, our, our conversation today was how does one become a partner in a venture firm? Um, it, there, there's two ways to become a partner. You go to work for a successful firm, uh, you learn the craft of being a venture capital and over time make enough successful investments that um, your partners want you to be a partner with them. And so you get brought into the partnership based on your success. It's a very similar pattern to what you might have at a law firm or an, an accounting firm where um, you earn your way into the partnership based on your success. The other way to become a partner is start your own firm. <laughs> and you're, you and two other people get together and wanna start a firm and guess what? The three of you are partners. Um, that too can work over time. It's just harder and it's usually done at lower scale, but um, it's another way to become a partner in a venture capital firm. Um, you don't need to be have a lot of money to be a partner. What you need to have is either a network, which you develop through your your history of uh, as a as an entrepreneur, or um, uh, your ability to be a successful investor that has to be demonstrated in a way that somebody gives you um, gives you the ability to be a partner. Um, the money that you're investing comes from institutions, like I mentioned earlier. So think of Stanford University or um, the California Employee Retirement System or uh, MetLife Insurance. I'm trying to think of other institutions. You know, uh, Bank of America has a practice that invests in venture funds, those sorts of things. Those institutions 
as well as family offices or foundations and endowments like the Gordon Moore Foundation or the Hewlett Foundation. Those foundations all invest in venture capital. That's where the money comes from to, uh, that you make, uh, write checks with, as, if you will, to invest in private companies. Um, what are the other jobs? Uh, the other jobs are really in the industry are really uh, around um, helping VCs be successful. So think of financial um, help around um, balancing the books and records and keeping track of the money. Uh, the other there's other jobs around um, human resources or helping with um, building uh, marketing and distribution networks for companies. All of that stuff is part of what. Uh, makes up a successful venture firm. Uh, there's a job around dealing with investors like me. Um, it's called investor relations. Um, a successful firm has people doing all those different jobs. Um, How do VCs and large funds operate when funding a new company? Um, usually, uh, this is sort of kind of ties into the earlier question. Um, venture firms, well, all investment firms in general are thought to be collaboration of, of thought. So you have a group of individuals sitting around the table thinking about success on the investments that want to be made. And that collaboration creates a smarter, uh, more thoughtful outcome than an individual just working on his own. That's the, the rule of thumb with in, um, asset management firms in general. And so venture is a very much a team sport. Um, when companies are being started and venture capitals come around the table, uh, either large funds or small funds to get a company off the ground, it's typically very collaborative and collegial. Uh, it only gets ugly um, when companies aren't successful. Uh, and then people um, get very um, feisty about how their money's being treated. And, and frankly, um, a lot of times will exercise certain rights they have based on the investments they've made uh, and insert their will on a company or other investors if they're not happy with the way things are progressing. But at the beginning with a new company, things are very collaborative. Um, The, um, let me, I'll talk about some of the stuff with Robin Hood and, and uh, Wall Street bets. So those are all, um, I would, so Robin Hood is, is a piece of software that allows uh, for individuals to invest in, in public companies much more easily than if they had to say open an account at Schwab because you can buy a fraction of a share of Amazon, for instance, as opposed to the whole share. And so uh, that software is what really has made the company successful. Although the mechanics of that software is really, the, the structure is a very simple broker dealer uh, uh, setup. So it, 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 you know, it's, it's typical of what happens in our industry is people come up with ideas of how to sort of take advantage of inefficiencies. And so they built software to do that. Um, what happened with Wall Street bets and, uh, and on uh, Reddit and um, squeezing that um, hedge fund as it relates to uh, GameStop really is a typical, it's not uncommon for that to happen. It happens lots of times in various different stocks. It just happened to be done through uh, a bunch of individuals. It's usually not a bunch of individuals. It's usually you know, one hedge fund disagreeing with another or a government. Um, if you go back into read about George Soros, which is a he's a famous hedge fund manager and how he and Peter Druckenmiller broke the Bank of England. Uh, essentially what they did was they outbet the Bank of England on the pound going down. And ultimately the Bank of England had to give in to their, their bet, just like what happened with GameStop. And they made a bunch of, a bunch of money because the Bank of England they thought was artificially inflating the value of the pound. And so they sold essentially pounds short uh, and sold and sold and sold and sold and sold. And ultimately the bank couldn't support that price. And so they let the pound collapse and Soros made a bunch of money, but that's a very similar outcome to GameStop. Um, 
it just happened with Reddit, right? Reddit, they, the social media community used Reddit, uh, or Reddit was the tool which they used to communicate, to collaborate their resources and force the hedge fund to cover their short in GameStop. Um, that's a whole new phenomena for our markets, but it's not any different than what George Soros did with the Bank of England. So I, I kind of think all of this stuff is, is sort of, uh, it's um, sideline noise to what's really going on in markets. Um, and you, you know, the press and people in social media and everybody gets worked up on it, but it, it's, it's not really relevant to the underlying core of what's, what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, and today, I think the biggest problem with the marketplace, if you could think about why the valuations are so high, is because interest rates are so low and that low cost of capital is forcing people to invest elsewhere. And so they've gone invested in the public markets um, and, and moved stocks up um, dramatically. But uh, Ben, I, that kind of completes my talk, um, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're done. Um, I'm happy to answer other questions. This was a real walk yeah. around the park as it related to venture capital, but I hope that was helpful in helping you guys think about the industry and how it plays a role in helping startups get off the ground, as well as how big a role it's played in, in the success of Silicon Valley and, and the real estate your parents all own. Yeah. Um, so Rahul had collected some submitted questions that people had sent in. Great. Um, that he's going to ask you. Okay. That's okay. That's great. Yeah, thank you. I think everybody kind of got a really good understanding of what um, VC is thanks to the presentation. So they just have a couple questions. So one person asked if a venture capital firm wants to exit their position, but the founders of the company don't want to IPO or sell off um, the business to another company, what other exit alternatives exist? Well, there's really only one, um, which is that they can sell their shares to another investor in what's today called the secondary market. And I talked about that early on um, a couple of times, but it's one of the things we do in our velocity funds is we acquire um, interest in private companies through other shareholders, from other shareholders via what's called a secondary transaction. And that's, it's, a, it's not a very um, public market or visible market, it's very opaque. And it's typically, you know, done uh, um, privately uh, with lawyers and negotiating over the phone with individuals. But it's, it's, it is something that's growing. And I would expect it to continue to grow uh, as an active way to get liquidity. Okay. Another question is, how is the Bay Area brain drain, which I guess is, um, you know, all these companies and people moving out to more affordable areas like Texas, how is that altering the VC landscape? Well, I, I talked about it earlier with that bubble chart with the purple, purple circles about how um, various different regions around the country are continuing to grow their startup activity because it's easier to start a business. Um, you know, areas like the Bay Area, as well as, Austin, Texas, or, or you know, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, they all go through peaks and valleys as it relates to their popularity. And so uh, the Bay Area in the last 10 years has been the most popular, desirous place to, to come, especially for young people, because they were looking for jobs and their jobs are plenty uh, and very, very prevalent. Uh, with COVID, it's become clear that you don't need to work you can work in the Bay Area, but not live in the Bay Area. So it's really changed the, the makeup of how employees and employers are thinking. Um, and so um, that's encouraged people to move other places. And frankly, where you can, you can go, your, your, your rent dollar or your cost of living can go a long way. And Texas is one of those places. Um, I think at the end, um, California and the Bay Area will always still be that Super Bowl spot and so as we come out of COVID and things settle down a little bit and we figure out how we can work either at our homes or in our offices that we'll start to get to some parity on that and then things should pick up again so um, one of the things because I travel so much uh, I travel all over the world I see venture capitalists from 
Hong Kong to Sydney to Berlin to London, the most successful talent, uh, technology talent in the world is still here. Um, it's not, you know, some of it will leave, but that whole net that nucleus, if you will, of talent will not, and um, they'll continue to innovate. And if you want to start a business, I can tell you, I've talked to entrepreneurs all over the place, the best place to, to build a company uh, because of that talent base uh, is here in San Francisco Bay Area. So I don't, I don't over time think the, the brain drain, if you will, is going to make a, make an impact. You might have a, a temporary uh, impact today because, frankly, um, we're not all going to be in an office building like we thought we were supposed to be um, uh, going forward, and so that's going to change the way we live. But I don't think it takes away from the Bay Area the way that people are hoping. Another question. Uh, this one's a bit more humorous. Um, you know, <laughs> how closely is um, the popular TV show Shark Tank um, to the actual process of, you know, talking to yeah. talking to these entrepreneurs and hammering out a deal? Yeah, it's um, that's a little Mickey Mouse and dramatic. Um, it's the whole concept of hammering out a deal is very similar because that's kind of how deals get hammered out. Um, you know, the guys on Shark Tank do it for the drama of Shark Tank. I think, um, you know, one of the industries or one of the TV shows that's more more factual than we'd all want it to be is actually the, the TV show Silicon Valley, uh, which talks about the unicorn company. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's in the compression space. Um, Pied Piper. Anyway, the, the experience that they've gone through and some of the craziness that uh, that went into that and the people and kind of the nerdiness of it um, is pretty is is a lot more factual than we'd like it to be. <laughs> All right. I think you mentioned um, for regular funds, but as far as a fund of funds goes, when can individual uh, investors expect to get their money back? Yeah. So um, let me talk to you about structure. So venture capital funds are 10 years in length because it typically takes somewhere between three to six years for the business to get big enough to be worth something and then another two or three years before it ultimately exits. So what usually happens is you and the companies are invested in over the first six years and they're kind of managed into to liquidity uh, over the rest of the life of the fund and sometimes longer than that. The average venture fund today actually, even though the structure is 10 years, the average fund today is about 12 because they have extensions on that structure. Uh, a fund of funds actually has a longer period of time because we invest in venture funds, which are 10 years long over a three year period because we want time diversity on top of everything else. So it's a very long holding period. Um, our funds are 12 years versus 10 with three one year extensions. So total of 15 years, we expect to return uh, investors capital over the first seven to eight years and then another multiple of capital over the next uh, four to five years. And so it usually at the end of the day on a blended basis, we're delivering kind of somewhere between two and two and a half times on your money. Our velocity funds on the other hand are much shorter because we're investing in companies that are later in life. So those funds are seven years in light, length uh, and we expect to return capital to the investor within three uh, and then a multiple on capital uh, within the next three. Okay. And um, one more question we got is what should startups and entrepreneurs think about before contacting a VC about getting funded? Um, Uh, you, t because of the competitive nature of our markets today, most seed companies are pretty far along on a product or have a very good idea about how to get that product far along based on the market they're going after. Sometimes you need money to kind of get started, but most of the times the company the guys have gotten it started because you all have computers, you all have access to, to Google Office. Uh, Amazon's um, web, web hosted services is incredibly cheap for storage and uh, various other things. And so um, it's what's made startup costs come down radically is, is frankly technology making it easier to start companies. So uh, usually there's some 
something close to a beta, uh, beta beta product, I mean, it's a, a stereo, you know, a, a stereotype of what the product's going to be or, or something of that nature before um, people are excited about giving you seed money. So usually your parents or your 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 family ecosystem helps. Uh, you know, your grandmother wants to give you some money because she's proud of you and she's excited about what you're doing or those sorts of things. And it's not a lot of money, but it's it's it helps you get things off the ground. My son started a company four years ago. Um, and so the way I helped him was I subsidized his income as he was getting it started, but he never raised outside capital. Um, today it has revenue and they've never raised outside capital. At some point they might when it gets, when it gets big enough and they think they want to make it bigger, but um, it, it's a type of business that doesn't necessarily need to raise outside capital to get it to work, which right now they're doing, it's get, starting to work. And our final question that we got um, a bit more personal is what part of the VC job do you find to be most fulfilling or satisfying? Yeah, well, we all have our different uh, foibles. I, um, I started my career in investment banking and developed a lot of relationships. And so what this job allowed me to do is take that network of relationships and turn it into an investment activity where I could make money off of my relationships as opposed to just, just be their, their banker, if you will. Um, and so I thoroughly enjoy that notion of sort of levering and cultivating and, and growing my network of relationships. And so, um, you know, I'm one of those people in, in the VC world today that kind of knows everyone. And um, that's kind of one of my super you know, killer apps, if you will. The other thing I like to do because I'm a salesman at heart is I like to raise money. So I, I've been the person that has been responsible for growing the firm over the last 20 years and really uh, raising a lot of the capital we raise, which is one of the reasons I travel so much because our investors are typically people that cannot access Silicon Valley like we can. And so they hire us to do it for them. And so those investors, so we have, you know, um, the government of Singapore, which is a sovereign wealth fund in Singapore, was an investor of ours at one point. Country of Canada and the country of Sweden and um, uh, South Korea. We have investors in Tokyo. We have investors in Mexico City. Um, just lots of different places, as well as around the United States. Okay. Well, yeah. um, I would just like to thank you for um, presenting for us. And we all really appreciate you being here. Um, and I hope that everybody could learn something by attending. Sure. And Ben, I think you have the slides. If you don't, I'll send them to you. But you, yes. you're more than welcome to uh, share those. Just PDF them for me when you share them with okay. people. And then um, we'll also be sharing a recording of the presentation, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I just wanted to um, thank you for presenting for us. Our pleasure. You guys take care and good luck with your careers. You too. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.